I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and today we are going to talk about the Cadigo 2024 Clinical Practice Guideline for the Evaluation and Management of Chronic Kidney Disease. The explosion of knowledge in this area has been nothing short of phenomenal. We now have medicines that can slow the rate of decline of kidney function, put off the need for dialysis, and decrease the elevated risk of heart disease that occurs in people with CKD. These guidelines give us much needed direction in how to do this. Increasing levels of CKD lead to increasing levels of cardiovascular disease as well as increased all-cause mortality. In addition, increasing severity of CKD substantially increases the likelihood of needing dialysis at some point in the future. Let's go on now to talk about screening. The guidelines are actually non-specific here, saying that we should test people who are at risk of CKD and those who have CKD. Screening should be with a serum creatinine, that's easy, to get an EGFR, and a urine for albumin to creatinine ratio, UACR. Also easy, but often not done. Both are required when screening and following people for CKD. More specifically then, who gets screened? Well, people with diabetes should receive annual screening. That's clear from the ADA guidelines. We can consider screening people who are also at otherwise high risk, those with hypertension, those with cardiovascular disease, particularly heart failure, and those who have had a previous acute kidney injury. The reality is that many people with CKD have that found incidentally when we get a basic or complete metabolic panel for some other reason. When the creatinine or the UACR are abnormal, they need to be repeated before making the diagnosis of CKD because there is significant both biologic and assay variability. Where the Cadigo update is most helpful, in my opinion, is in clarifying what to do with the results we get. That is, when should we act on CKD to slow the progression and decrease cardiovascular risk? The main methods for slowing the rate of uh, decline of EGFR is good blood pressure control, the use of renin angiotensin system inhibitors, that's RASI, ACEs and ARBs, the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, and in selected patients with diabetes, a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid antagonist. Let's now go through each of these in turn. As we go through the recommendations, be aware that the term recommend implies a strong recommendation that is based on strong evidence, and the term suggest is not as strong a recommendation based on evidence. It's not as strong. Cadiga recommends a systolic blood pressure goal of less than 120 millimeters of mercury. This is a 2B recommendation. Note that in the body of the text, they say, by aiming for a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 millimeters per mercury, more adults with CKD will achieve systolic blood pressures of less than 130 millimeters of mercury. I might actually have a target consistent with the general hypertension guidelines for high-risk individuals of less than 130. For more details, see our discussion linked here to our discussion of hypertension. Next up, <clears throat> renin angiotensin system inhibitors, RASI, meaning ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Notice, these recommendations apply to people with CKD whether or not they have elevated blood pressure. Now. If someone has diabetes and CKD with moderate to severe albuminuria, that's a UACR greater than 30, then RASI is recommended. That's a 1B recommendation. For people without diabetes, then RASI is recommended for people with CKD and severe albuminuria, that is a UACR greater than 300, that's a 1B recommendation, and suggested for people with CKD and moderate albinuria. That is a UACR 30 to 300. That's a 2C recommendation. In addition, titrate RASI to the highest approved dose that is tolerated. Check blood pressure and creatinine and potassium within two to four weeks, either after start of RASI or after uh, any increase in dose. Continue ACE inhibitors and ARBs in people with CKD even when the EGFR falls below 30. 
Let's go on now to the SGLT2 inhibitors. This is an important new class of medicines with randomized trial data showing a beneficial effect on slowing the rate of renal decline as well as decreasing MACE. And one trial even shows a substantial effect over two and a half years. That's not very long in decreasing cardiovascular and total mortality. Recommendations for people with CKD are as follows. If they have diabetes, then the guidelines recommend treating people with diabetes and CKD and an EGFR greater than 20 with an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they don't have diabetes, the guidelines recommend with a level 1A grade of evidence, level of recommendation, adults with an EGFR greater than or equal to 20 and a UACR greater than 200. Or if adults have heart failure, irrespective of the level of the albumin in the urine, they should be treated with an SGLT2. The guidelines suggest with a 2B rating that adults with an EGFR from 20 to 45 be treated even with a urine albumin to creatinine ratio less than 200. Once started on an SGLT2, the SGLT2 can be continued even if the EGFR falls below 20 until dialysis is initiated. Let's go on now to talk about the MRA receptor antagonist finirinone, which is suggested in adults with type 2 diabetes, an EGFR greater than 25, normal serum potassium concentrations, and albuminuria greater than 30, despite maximum tolerated dose of a RAS inhibitor. They are most appropriate in those with persistent albuminuria, despite other standard of care therapies. A lot of people ask about the GLP-1 receptor agonist. The guidelines note that the results of the flow study of semaglutide on kidney outcomes in people with CKD, albuminuria, and type 2 diabetes is expected later this year. Additional approaches to reducing the elevated cardiovascular risk are also important. That includes treatment of hyperlipidemia, elevated glucose, weight management, and the importance of a proper diet and having adequate exercise. Also important in management of CKD is addressing metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, and CKD mineral bone disorder. These are addressed in the guidelines in detail, but go beyond what we have time to cover today. This is a lot of information for something that we are now seeing and identifying regularly in the office. I'm interested in your thoughts. Please leave them. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and this is Medscape.